Well, good evening or good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm here for EdChat Interactive. Uh, tonight, we're having a session on one of my passions, which is game-based learning. And uh, the person who's going to be leading us is uh, is a friend of mine uh, named Matt Farber, who is a friend of a lot of yours as well, uh, who is well known in game-based learning circles, has written three books and uh, teaches in Colorado. Um, I think uh, just so that you know, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to EdChat Interactive and what's different about about us, um, and then uh, and then introduce Matt. And let me just ex expand this for a moment. Uh, what we're trying to do with EdChat Interactive is to allow people who are doing really interesting things in education to share them with other educators, and we're trying to do that in a format that's more conducive to adult learning than what a typical webinar is. So you see right now, there's me as a talking head and there's my slides, but the whole purpose of tonight is to get you to interact more with each other and with the presenter. Because as adults, we, we have to have a reason for learning and we learn best when we're interacting with other people. In order to do that, we're using a platform called Shindig, which operates a little bit different from most other platforms that you're used to. So I th what I'll do is give you an, a, an introduction to Shindig. If you look on your screens, you'll see that each of you has a video avatar and underneath your avatar is a menu. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of the icons on the menu, uh, I guess the first one I'd like to go through is something called text chat. Text chat allows you to text the other people here. Um, and I'd like you to try that now. I'm gonna shrink the screen a little bit. I'd like you to click on that text chat icon. That's going to open up a dialog box that's going to look like this. And then just type in there and introduce yourself. You know, what's your name, where are you from? Uh, what's something that you want to learn tonight? And if there's something that somebody else types in that you have an answer for that you want to comment on, uh, please comment on that. And that will also clue Matt in to some of the things that you all want to discuss tonight. The one person who can't see what you're typing in is me. So I'm hoping that you're all uh, text chatting now. And I'll give you a chance to do that. And at the same time, since I know you all are multiprocessors because you're all gamers or, or gamer wannabes. Um, if you look back at your av those avatars or the, those icons again, the one to the right of text chat is a question mark. That's for asking questions. And when you ask a question, the question comes to me. If it's a technical question, I can try to, I'll try to answer it. Um, but if it's a question for Matt, I'll pass the question on to him and then he can answer the question or sometimes he'll just ask you to come up on stage because maybe it'll trigger a really good conversation. There's going to be times that Matt's talking that you're going to want to contribute. And if you want to come up on stage because Matt said something that you want to amplify or um, I can't imagine anybody wanting to disagree with anything that Matt Farber says. But if you do happen to disagree and want to talk to him about it, click on raise hand and I can bring you up on stage and you can have a discussion that everybody can hear. So those are three of the ways of interacting text chat, asking questions, raising hands if you want to come up on stage. And the third way of interacting is to create uh, these small uh, chat groups. And so if you were to click on the avatar of another person, and I see two people are already doing that. Matt's uh, talking to Al Gonzalez. You can probably see that also. Um, but if you click on the avatar of another person, you can have a private video conversation with another person or two people or up to five people in a small group. And nobody else can hear it except for your small group. We may be using that tonight because Matt may throw out some questions and say break into, break into small groups and discuss them, in which case um, I'll come back up on stage and I'll explain again how to do it. Uh, but it's, it's really simple. You just click on the avatar of another person and start talking. If you don't have a mic and it's time for doing, doing the sharing, you can always go back to that text chat and type in there. Matt will see it and so will most of the other people who are here. So those are, those are the different ways that we interact. I also want to say uh, coming up on EdChat Interactive on June 20th is another session 
um, not just on game-based learning, although a lot of the techniques uh, he'll be talking about are game-based learning, but, but a number of you know Paul Darvasi, who's, who does some really interesting things with education. And he's going to be talking about um, six transformative lessons that different teachers in his school have used to engage students and invite you all to talk about how you might apply them in your classes. So that's really interesting. And of course, a lot of us are going to be going to the Serious Play Conference or Serious Play Conferences. Um, if you haven't heard of it, go to the seriousplayconf.com and take a look at it. Uh, there's there's really great speakers. There'll be good um, there'll be good interactions with other people. Uh, Sue puts on a really great um, conference, so I encourage you all to check it out. Uh, and I encourage you all to sign up for the session with Paul in June. And now let me bring up our star, Matt Farber. So Matt, welcome to EdChat Interactive. This is actually your second. It is my second, yes. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming here, everybody. I know it's a little bit different um, than dropping in a Twitter chat when your face or like, you know, at least your name is on the bottom of the screen there right. <laughs> or on the screen. <laughs> So slightly more uh, more of a commitment when you might be asked to speak. <laughs> so you you know you use games a lot in, in your classroom, and now you teach uh, you know you teach at, at university. Do you actually get to use games with the you know in your teaching still? Yes. So uh, I taught uh, middle school for nine years, social studies, um, and I have a uh, master's and doctorate in educational technology. Um. And uh, I currently I'm in the uh, technology innovation and pedagogy program at the University of, of Northern Colorado. It's a very verbose <laughs> title, <laughs> but um, it's uh, training teachers. So it's uh, a master's and PhD level students, and I also have undergraduate students. And I'm currently teaching a class right now of master's students, which just started yesterday in summer class. <laughs> and uh, we'll be playing breakout edu tomorrow as soon as we get there. Oh, cool. Um, okay, so I'm going to bring myself down. I'm going to expand your slides so that they fill the screen and just tell me, just, you know, tell me when to advance. Sure. Um, let's see. I'm just trying to adjust my view here. Is there a way to do that? Like my, oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> I just had a chat thing all the way open. Anyway, uh, welcome, everybody. So I have a few slides, but not too many because this is, um, as uh, Mitch said, interactive. So I don't want to lose the interactive piece. Plus, there are several people here from the tribe who I'll explain what that is in a bit. But I don't, you know, I don't want to um, take all the time talking. But that's my contact information down there. It's uh, fairly straightforward to find out. My uh, Twitter, my um, website, as well as my book, my newest book. Um, advance, <laughs> click. Oh, look at that. So yeah, that's where I teach. Um, and, uh, it's, uh, I also teach educational technology classes. Uh, but this is, um, this innovation piece is something that, um, more universities are taking on, uh, in their ed tech programs, such as, uh, I think Harvard may have started that, adding innovation to it, as well as, uh, the other UNC, UNC Chapel Hill, where uh, our friend uh, Lisa Dolly teaches, uh, they also have innovation in their name. I don't remember the full name of their program, but you know, it's the idea of getting students to be super creative, uh, not just using technology. <clears throat> Next, click. Look at that. Oh, look at that book promotion. So um, as uh, it said, I have a, a couple of books. Actually, I have a third one I edited, but I didn't put it here. Um, so Gamify Your Classroom is uh, not a gamification book, except for one chapter on gamification. It's a field guide to game-based learning. It's basically about bringing games into the classroom. But it's a survey of how teachers, or actually not how teachers, but what is out there for using games in the classroom uh, and how play engenders learning. And uh, the book on the other side, Game-Based Learning in Action, is my newest book. Uh, that is a forward by James Paul G, who coined the phrase affinity spaces and affinity groups. And um, 
that's what my book is about there. It's uh, an extension for my dissertation, which is how uh, an affinity space and group of teachers use games in a classroom. Essentially, the intersection of really good teachers and really good games. As I was explaining to Mitch, though, Mitch is in the tribe and he's not a teacher. So uh, in this particular book, I really focus on classroom teachers um, that, that I knew at the time also. Um, after serious play last July, uh, Paul DeVarsi uh, started a, a closed Facebook group for us to uh, share ideas back and forth, which kind of um, was um, solidifying, I guess, or cementing the, the tribe, because that's what it's called, uh, as a, a formalized space on a social media platform. But that's not the only place we meet, of course. There's uh, other ways we uh, interact and share in uh, this open sense. Um, and then the middle is a uh, working paper I co-author with, uh, with uh, Dr. Karen Schreier from Marist, uh, The Limits and Strengths of Using Digital Games as Empathy Machines. And this is where my work is currently in research uh, between how teachers use games in the classroom. Um, I'm in the middle of um, co-researching a uh, study on the Minecraft uh, global mentor program. And I am also in a few different research projects that have to do with social emotional learning and empathy around games. So the uh, third book that's not pictured is the Game Jam Guide, which is free from ETC Press, which is a curriculum guide I co-edited on um, um, basically game jams or kids making games based on certain themes. And I'm also new on the uh, board of directors, subtle plug here, for GGJ Next, which is Global Game Jam Next, which is a uh, for uh, ages 12 to 17 or so. And uh, it's a global game jam for kids, and it's a nonprofit, and it's uh, ggjnext.org. Mm, click, click. So, yeah, so again, there's my book in higher resolution, surrounded by gold dust. But I should say, Paul. Hey, that's Paul DeVarsi's uh, photo, uh, his uh, student in that particular picture, playing "Gone Home." But more on that when we put Paul on the spot next. So my research again is in the tribe. The tribe. Um, what I did, because it's a book adaptation of a dissertation, is it gave me a lot more freedom to um, well to write how I want to write without having to have the fear of a committee in a locked room asking me lots of questions. <laughs> so I, I already went through that boss level part of uh, higher, uh, higher ed. And uh, what I did was I was able to kind of reverse engineer my dissertation. So it gave me a lot more levity to go back and find the origin story of the tribe. And the tribe really goes back uh, to um, Peggy Sheehy and Bron Stuckey and Marian Malmstrom. And uh, they had these red bandanas that they would give out at ISTE at that conference, at Games and Education Symposium in upstate New York. And the Games and Education Symposium, every year, every summer, the speaker's dinner, and um, how we are all, as Chris Haskell, who's also in the tribe, said to me, we're all kind of sequestered together away from everything else. And... Um, you know, these are the moments that really helped us grow as teachers, uh, sharing what works. Because like Peggy Sheehy teaches with World of Warcraft in the classroom, if a server goes down, she can't go ask the teacher next door, what do I do? Actually, she could ask her principal because he's in her guild. <laughs> but um, most teachers can't, you know, even uh, Minecraft still, right? Still fairly novel uses in the classroom. So we rely on social media and we re rely on our affinity space of like-minded teachers. And um, that's basically the tribe uh, right there. So um, next slide, please. So here we are, me and my dissertation partners, uh, participants, uh, Steve, Paul, and Peggy. And I have a commercial that um, you can play from Games and Education. Got that one? Mitch illegally downloaded some videos from YouTube, but don't tell anybody in the FCC or anything.
We are pleased oh, we to go. announce this year's Games and Education Symposium on August 6th and 7th, free to educators, homeschoolers, and school administrators. Join us at Tech Valley High School in Albany, New York, to experience new techniques in interactive learning. Hear from teachers as they share practical examples to engage students and inspire learning with games and digital technology. Visit gamesandeducation.org for more information. Thanks. I also happen to use that video of my dissertation defense, which is always fun to have a commercial in the middle of your defense. <laughs> kind of gives you a second to breathe. Uh, but that is the uh, Games and Education Symposium, which is interesting because it is um, presenting to teachers, and it's free for teachers to go. Uh, it's not like an academic conference where you would have you know, mostly um, academics there. Um, it is uh, you're teaching to teachers who are interested in teaching with games. Next slide. So we also get together IRL. I don't know if this quite counts because, you know, we're on a computer. But, uh, you know, most recently, actually not even most recently, most recently uh, several of us were in Boston together. But the time before that, back in March, we were at South By, and uh, here's a picture of us. And, you know, this, this kind of never ends. Like I was on a phone call this morning with James Collins, who's seated right next to me uh, there with the beard um, about a grant that he's helping to work on. So, you know, we, we are in constant touch with one another, um, almost like on hyperdrive. I, I, I sort of feel that because of the book and, um, and the Facebook group, uh, the tribe is, based, is somewhat branded, which is good because we were able to um, speak together as a voice and share uh, what, what works and best practice in the classroom. And Christina didn't get to go. That's the comment. Okay, so I'm going to talk really briefly here about the difference between gamification and game-based learning. Ready? <laughs> this is a, I know Steve has a blog post about this also, but um, and it's an, uh, an infographic. I'm not sure if he created an infographic or not, but it's a, it's a helpful starting point between the difference of gamification and game-based learning. Uh, this is a tribe of game-based learning teachers, some of whom might use gamification, but not all. Gamification is, I guess, formally defined as using parts of games in non-game contexts, like you might have with your Starbucks app with different gold stars or rewards um, in, in certain applications or social rewards or badging also. Um, and uh, sometimes grading using experience points instead of percentages. Um, so these are different types of gamification. And I observe some of this on, on Twitter. And a lot of it, well, I mean, as far as in my bubble of, watch, of observing on Twitter, seems to be um, low-hanging fruit where uh, teachers are, like, creating their class as a game and calling it a game. And they are using, um, you know, a reward system like, you know, uh, like playing cards or role-playing game type cards. And students can trade up and, and have these rewards. But some of them seem quite extrinsic, like the ability to open the window, um, you get that reward, or eating a snack at your desk. And it's, it's very teacher-directed. Um, I don't look at game-based learning like that. I look at game-based learning as... Uh, from an educational psychology perspective, where play drives learning, and as Vygotsky wrote, you know, play without play, there's no zone of proximal development. Also, uh, you know, you need a, the ability to play. You need the ability to be in this safe to fail space, and uh, this is how the tribe teaches with games. It's sort of like a mixtape. So, my question is, um, what is a mixtape? What, who would make a mixtape? Why do you make a mixtape? That's to everybody. So are you, do you want people, somebody to raise their hand and come up on stage and yeah, give an answer? That would be good. Yeah. That, that so would yeah. So, so, um, so somebody who's older than uh, 30, uh, who remembers <laughs> or mixtapes. Or seeing Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> right. Or, um, oh geez, what's the, what's the one that just came out in March? Um, that was based on the Y. No, no, the 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 um the movie that came out that everybody that I even saw, uh, Ready Player One. 
Ready Player One uh, dealt with mixed, yeah. had mixtapes too. So, so somebody who knows what a mixtape is, click on the raise hand, on the raise hand, and let us bring you up. And, um, oh come on! All right, so I'm going to pick on Steve. Um, oh, Steve, I can't pick on Steve. He's he he. Oh yeah, no, I can't pick on Steve. Never mind. Let me let me bring him up here. We're having a Minecraft T-shirt contest. Oh, okay. <laughs> Am I here? So, so, oh, I... oh, and somebody else raise raise your hand also. So, uh, Mark raised his hand. So, Steve, you can start talking about it. I'm going to bring myself down, and I'm going to bring Mark up also. Okay. Well, can you hear me? I guess everybody yes. can hear me now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, I I recall very very much so making a mixed tape for my uh, prior to her being my wife for my girlfriend at the time. And I think mm -hmm. I thought that was the only reason anybody would make a mixtape, really. But maybe there are other reasons. <laughs> That's a good reason, yeah. And Mark? Hi, Mark. Hey, I did the same thing, uh, making mixtapes for girlfriends and actually my current wife. Um, but, I mean, mixtapes are because you didn't like all the music that that band had. Right? You liked a couple songs, so you wanted to put them on the mixtape. And so... And what about the that order, is, by the way? I, 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 there is a movie clip, but I didn't uh, give it to Mitch at this time. That's what about true. The order I, of mean, songs? I would think I it should say, tell a story of sorts. Mm -hmm. I, I was going to say that, that you usually put the ones you liked best first. And then as the mixtape was running towards the end, the second side, you know, that you got to the ones that were, I will just fill the rest of it with this. Good. Perfect. Thanks. So I'm going to have Mitch play a video clip now. Okay, I'll get you guys off the stage somehow. Okay. You have that second video clip? It's from a movie. What are you listening to? The Shins. You know them? No. You gotta hear this one song. It'll change your life, I swear. Oh, I'm sorry. You have to. Uh, I gotta fill out your forms. Conundrum. Think you could uh, maybe listen yeah, while I think you could? I can handle it. Yeah. Okay. So if you recall uh, in that short clip from um, Garden State, Natalie Portman's face, right? While she's, while she's getting, it's an emotion. You get this emotion from giving somebody this amazing gift. And that's how the tribe teaches with games. The tribe curates like a mixtape. They pick really good games, really interesting games, not games that are teaching to a test, not turning the classroom into a game, unless it's an alternate reality game or a breakout puzzle, but something really meaningful and exciting. That's how the tribe teaches. The tribe is, is excited and engaged about using interesting curriculum in a class. And by the way, it doesn't have to be a game. It could be, you know, somebody's favorite play, um, some, some short story, a blog post, uh, a podcast, something super interesting that you're curating like a mixtape, and then you're giving students choice to come to that, right? So in a way, I would say that the way the tribe teaches or gamifies is not the traditional gamification way, but more like an open world game, like uh, Assassin's Creed where you can go wherever you want and you are invited through these curated affordances to participate in these really interesting activities. Next slide. Thanks. And of course we can't get that with a, with a textbook, right? Uh, and preaching to the choir, I'm shouting in the uh, echo chamber here, but you cannot get that from a textbook. Um, and uh, next slide. That's basically the point there. <laughs> so games can be rich mediated experiences, particularly commercial games. The, uh, what I've observed with the tribe is the tribe uh, rarely uses commercial games. There are a few exceptions like those from iCivics, for example, but you know, those are made by uh, a company called um, Filament Games and Filament Games is uh, very adept at making games that are actually good, you know. <laughs> uh, 
where so few are. Uh, they also use games that are serious games, as they say, uh, games that are uh, posted on Games for Changes site. Um, and more importantly, they treat games almost agnostically as they would treat books or film. Games are media. Games are not treated as uh, the teaching machine. Games are something, uh, a space for students to learn like a field trip, and then they create from that. It's right front and center in the middle of the classroom, the same way you would put To Kill a Mockingbird in the classroom, teach, have students read it, journal about it, make projects about it, and games are used the same way. And sometimes, like Steve Isaacs, will have an educational game and do the same thing and have students write about it and review it uh, because we want as much student voice and choice as possible in these types of mediated experiences. Click. Next. So um, my, the teachers in the tribe are, for the most part, transformational leaders. They meet the definition of being a transformational leader. That is trying to change somebody's belief system in the way they teach. Uh, try to get them to um, embrace the uh, unexpectedness of using these types of games in the class. However, in the classroom, uh, the, these teachers pivot their leadership model to become um, servant leaders. Servant leaders are those that lead from behind, like the Sherpa people. Uh, you could see Peggy Sheehy there in circle time. Her students were messing up your, your, and your, just like most of my Facebook friends from high school. <laughs> and she stopped the class. She did a flash lesson, which she calls it, uh, which is what Jim G in a game would call just-in-time on-demand teaching. She pulled everybody into circle. They talked about your, your, and your. They all had to watch and pass a brain pop video and quiz on it. And then they were allowed to proceed with teaching. And you could see she is at knee level with students. She is not doing a, um, you know, a TED talk in front of them uh, like a transformational leader would. In the class, it's a servant leader. Next. So this is this quote from Lev Vygotsky, published in 1978, written like 50 years before that, summarizes why you would use games in the classroom. Uh, in fact, yesterday teaching grad students, I showed a video clip from uh, Jim Pike, uh, one of the tribe out in California. And uh, he had a student who was 11 years old create a game about cellular microbiology where you are putting on this wingsuit in Minecraft and you're going through phospholipids. Uh, you would not learn that when you're 11, right? But because of the game mediating his experience, because he's bringing and harnessing students' interests into the classroom using a game, that student was able to go above his average age in learning. Click. So this is um, part of what I also observed in these classrooms, gameful learning. This is from uh, uh, Remy Kalir, who's uh, changed his name um, when he uh, got married. Um, and um, that's on his website. He has a lot of really good material on his website, remycalier.com. He teaches also here in Colorado. And um, he co-wrote this paper, and it was about gameful learning. And this is actually what his chapter is in the back of uh, the, the conclusion, rather, the back, <laughs> the conclusion of Teacher Pioneers, which is a really good book, uh, which you can get on ETC Press. Um, edited by uh, Cara Williams Pierce. We had a big overlap, and she also chatted with me in my book, and I used her book uh, last semester in my class. And um, gameful learning is just this, because I was wondering, why would you want to play a game over and over again? Why do we like to play games like Werewolf or Pandemic over and over again, or Super Mario Brothers? If you put it in front of me now, I would play it. And that's because it's gameful, uh, it's this intersection of lucery attitudes, which is from an essay by Bernard Suits in 1978 called The Grasshopper. And um, in lucery attitudes, you willingly accept the voluntary condition, the um, not voluntary, the um, artificial constraints of a game system. Uh, in tic tac toe, you you just know not to put an O in a box where there's already an X, right? Um, and uh, growth mindset, actually, the, the buzzword now in education, 
that always would follow if you have a illusory mindset, because an illusory mindset, you're immediately in a safe to fail environment. So all these things you talk about grit and growth mindset, um, I, I believe that if you have illusory attitude, then that will follow. Um, rather than just saying, you know, the power of yet, not yet, the power of not yet, and putting up a bunch of posters in your class that say that, if you have a lot of illusory attitudes in your teaching, then that will follow. Uh, we also have identity play, which is uh, Jim G's projective identity, where you are making decisions based on the role you are taking on in a game. And this uh, notion of high quality ignorance, which um, um, I actually have the, the book right here, um, which uh, Remy... Uh, suggested and it's about not ignorance like we see in uh you know politics these days but ignorance in uh not knowing the outcome so not using didactic games not using games that are like textbooks where the right answer is in the back of the book and don't look as um um oh i forgot his name said <laughs> for the ted talk but anyway um it's the idea of not knowing what that answer is and this also is what i believe saves a lot of teachers from burnout like the tribe because we are also gameful teachers. We don't know what's going to happen if we put this new awesome video game we played on Steam in front of a class. I have no idea what's gonna happen. Uh, we were playing uh, Dead Last in Boston, the social deduction game. If I put that out in my classroom, I have no idea what's gonna happen, right? Probably crazy things. And that's what makes teaching exciting. It's not exciting when you teach out of a canned lecture. Next. So this is a, uh, another graphic about illusory learning here, illusory attitudes rather. So it's a difference between what Johann Huziga calls the magic circle, um, you know, this free to safe environment. And uh, in my study of Paul's class, Paul DeVarsi's class, when his students were playing Gone Home, they were playing as, um, you know, as a, a 18 year old, I think, right, girl. And, you know, they are making these decisions. Paul said, you have the next three hours to snoop around the house. You, you wouldn't normally do that. So it's a, that safe environment of the game, and that's where learning happens. Ah, question. So how can we make learning playful and gameful? Mitch has his hand up. Yep, yep, yep. no, no. So, so there's a couple of different ways that, that we can do this, and I'll leave it to you. Uh, people could, you could ask people to break them into small groups, and I can explain to them how to do that. Or if you'd rather, people can just click on the raise hand button and we can bring them up on stage and they can talk about it with you. And uh, in addition, people who have text can be typing them into the text box and you can comment on them. I'm thinking small groups. Okay. Yeah, those because, are fun. Because, the, uh, because then there's a few questions in a row and then uh, let's sort of back to some slides. Okay. So, so, um, so basically... Yeah. So, so basically what you're going to do, and I'm going to, um, I'll bring you down, Matt, so you can join any of the groups as well. Um, so let me bring you down first uh, so you can join the groups. And you're going to see, uh, you know, you see everybody else is floating around on, on the screen. Just click on another person's icon, or if you see two people talking, you can click on their, their icon and you can um, ask to join and uh, discuss this question about, you know, how in your school or in your practice uh, or your classroom, um, how you do or how you can make learning Playful. I see. Um, I see a few of you already doing that. I'm going to bring myself down. Uh, Ping has his hand raised. So, um, Ping, I'll, I'll I'll talk to you in a second. But everybody, feel free to uh, talk to each other. And Matt and I will come back up in a minute. Okay. So now I'm back up. I have to find Matt. Matt, could you uh, click on the raise hand button so I can find you? Um, uh, there you are. Okay. Good. All right. So let me bring Matt up. Um, and so here comes Matt and let's see. Okay. So you're back up. So, uh, did you, were you able to get into a discussion with people? Me? Yes. No, I was on Twitter. <laughs> Just kidding. Ah, okay. Oh, <laughs> you got me. <laughs> hey, no, you know, so me, I'm, the one, I'm the one who's supposed to joke, not you. So like, <laughs> don't do that again. <laughs> so yeah, we, what do uh, we, we do? We have group share outs. So what happens uh -huh. next? Well, yeah? so um, so let's you know 
let's have a couple people raise their hands. Maybe, maybe Al or, um, you know, we already uh, made Steve come up, so I don't want to make him come up again unless he wants to. But uh, somebody who's willing to come up on stage, click on the raise hand button. Um, and what I might do, if I can find her, um, I don't see a raised hand. Come on. It's fun. Um, uh, come on, John Carlo. Oh, there's a raised hand. Okay, Catherine. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to bring Catherine up. And yeah, and then you can talk about with Catherine what, what uh, she does, what she wants to do, um, and her ideas. And here she is. Hey, Catherine. Hello. Hello. Um, so um, I was in a group with kindergarten teachers, and we talked about how um, the possibility of offering different badges, and the kids could choose the badge that they wanted to try and get. Um, and mm -hmm. then they could level up in that badge. Great, yeah. You know, uh, my, my, it's interesting. We've been spending so many years on badges, and I've been following that. And my go-to person for badges is Noah Geisel, who's here in Colorado. He does badge chat and a lot of work with badges. Um, and, and those sound great. And, you know, what's, what's interesting, what Noah says and his attitude is, if it works, it works. So, you know, whatever, whatever works. We don't even know, actually. So like Lucas Gillespie, right? He has this whole series of teacher professional development badges um, in uh, North Carolina, right? And um, mm -hmm. yep. it's, it's on his uh, website, which is a great website, epicacademy.info. And uh, as it turns out, the teachers, teachers were getting badges, but they wanted physical badges. They wanted badges to hang on this felt, um, like a crest, like a medieval crest on their wall, uh, so on their window actually to their classrooms. So other teachers can see what they were really, what they mastered. And students could also say, oh, this is the teacher that's really good at, you know, Google Maps, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, and another point is, um, well, we just don't know. It's so new, badges, right? Um, so we need lots of teachers to uh, share what works. Um, my son's in Cub Scouts, and boy, they know their badges. <laughs> You know, you have a whole packet of things you have to do, right, to get a badge. They, there's a game design badge, too, for Boy Scouts. But um, it just got me thinking, like, why reinvent the wheel sometimes? You know, they have this whole packet, you know, for, like, bicycle safety badge. You have to, um, you have to answer all these questions, demonstrate these things, talk to a safety officer or whatever, and then you, you give in that certificate and you get that ceremony to get that badge. So, um, you know... I think it's a wonderful thing, these uh, ideas of using micro-credentials like that. What does scare me, though, is when it becomes um, this, like, system of, um, you know, using – that's my dog, sorry. Using, um, using experience points gained in a class um, as, like, these power-ups in the class. To me, it seems very sticker economy-like. But, again, Noah pointed out, if that works, that works. So. You know, <laughs> if hey, it works, Catherine, it do you, works, you know. <laughs> do you teach kindergarten? Uh, I teach kindergarten, yes. Okay. So, it, it, and it seems to me that kids are naturally playing in kindergarten, right? You know, yeah. it must be a lot of fun to, to get them playing and watch them learning and excite each other. Yeah. Well, um, we wanted, I wanted them to focus on, I guess, beating themselves versus it being a competition with others. Right. And that's what the Cub Scouts do so well, right? You know, you, you, you get your own badge like that. And, you know, um, Mitch Resnick from uh, MIT, he calls um, mm -hmm. kindergarten the greatest invention uh, because, <laughs> yes. because of that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's just, I, we, I see this in the upper grades. The teachers are borrowing a lot from the kindergarten model. So instead of having make-believe dress-up area or construction area, it's Minecraft and it's, you know, this other game or cardboard and hot glue guns. And, and then you've got your, you know, brain pop videos and then you go where you need to go. Okay. And it looks like uh, we have another person who's volunteering. And so uh, thank you, Catherine. I'm, I'm going to bring, um, I'm going to bring Mark up. And while Mark's coming up, um, 
I think I'm going to take issue with your question, Matt. My question? Because, yeah, your question, which is how can we make learning plain, playful and gameful? And I'm going to say the playfulness and the fun out of learning. But naturally, hmm. learning is playful. So what do you think of that? Well, actually, that's what Jim G said to me. And uh, I have him quoted in my he, first he got book, Gamify Classroom. He got it from you? <laughs> <laughs> he, he, made, he made a food analogy, though. He said it was like uh, food. Like we make food very bland and we take – because humans have a natural appetite for learning, like we have an appetite mm -hmm. to eat, but we make we make that very bland and boring. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so yeah, Martin, you know what I, I I had the opportunity to teach I teach grade one for a bunch of years. So my actual first I, I started off in a grade in grade six, but then I got booted down to grade one. And I stayed there for like six years, and I loved it. And what you say, Mitch, is I I, I agree a hundred percent. Like the only way. They, the, 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 the little ones, like five, six, seven year olds, like to learn is by playing. Right? It was the, the, like that is the best way to get through to them. But then as we get up into the higher grades, because eventually I was special ed and I was a vice principal, eventually you start to see that, that play sort of just, it, it, for some reason, we take it out. And you, know, you see the, the really good teachers trying to keep it in for sure, but it seems like the natural progression seems to like take it out. Like my kids are 14 and 16 right now, so grade nine and grade 11. And my grade 11 boy, there is no play at all. He's in the midst mm -hmm. of it right now because it's, it's the end of the school year and he's doing all this stuff. But, you know, it's strictly, you know, just rote learning, put your head down and do it. And I wonder why we, you know, as educators, we sort of chose to do that because it, it, it doesn't seem to be intuitive to, what, to your point, Mitch. The learning well, is always – Playful. Some of it is ingrained in the system. Some of it is that teachers do have a lot of pressure and they have a lot of things to do, you know, a lot, not like outside work things to do, but, you know, there's so many demands on teaching um, and teachers yeah. with testing and everything. And, uh, yeah, I mean, in college, um, this is a, a quote Barry Fishman, a professor of Michigan, said to me that high school used to be uh, for getting kids ready for college and now high school is just for getting uh, kids prepared to get into college. And once they're into college, they're unprepared. And, uh, you know, I don't just mean like unprepared for like writing and those sorts of things, but unprepared for choice. You know, it takes me a couple of weeks to get students uh, ready to uh, have the idea that they have choice. Or, you know, I have genius hour in my classes and they are able to decide what projects they want to pursue and follow their passions. And boy, on a, you know, a 23 year old student who's really good at that feedback loop of worksheets, standardized tests, and uh, grades. It's tough. <laughs> but yeah, they get it. They're not used to the choice. They're not used to the choice. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. And, uh, you know, just a, a, another thing that's, in, you know, just from data, you know, you, you find out that, you know, kids in kindergarten, um, something like 75, 80, 85 percent of the kids love school. But on the other hand, when the kids, when you ask kids in high school, do you find school relevant? Do you find school fun? It's down to like 20, 25 percent. I think um, yeah, that's absolutely. kind of a sad. I, I, would, I, I wonder when that actual drop off actually starts, Mitch. Like, is it, or, like, is it middle, earlier than that? Because I would say by grade six, yeah. If you ask yeah. them in grade six, there's going to be few and far between. So, yeah, I love school like the grade ones do. So um, there's a group of five people, and one of you has your hand up, but I can't figure out which one has your hand up. So um, I'm going to kind of pick one of you. I'm, I'm hoping that it's Al. Because, Mark, I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to bring you down, and I'm going to bring Al what? up. And, Al, if I messed up and it wasn't you, then uh, you've, been, you've been volunteered. Oh, and it wasn't you because I see that there's a hand still up. But anyhow, well, welcome to the stage. Thank you. I think it was Steve. Steve wanted to talk. <laughs> okay. All right. Actually, so, you, uh, so you, uh, want, you uh, want to go to the next slide because then we can it kind of semi relate. Oh, sure. We can yeah. talk about that like whole group like this. Ooh. Okay. We, and you know what I'm going to do? Go. I'm going to bring myself down, and the three of you can talk about this next slide. Um, actually, this next slide here is about. Um, uh, student choice and voice. And this is a screenshot of Classcraft, which I use in higher ed. But I don't use Classcraft's um, reward system that's built in because I can't tell a 30-year-old you know, PhD student that they can eat a candy bar in class because they're, <laughs> they're a mage. <laughs> well, I can, but 
but I use it for choice. I use it um, for experience. You know, I'm not going to talk about gamification when we can do it. Uh, but my favorite flavor of gamification, if you will, is this, this questing, the idea of choice. And um, I, 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 I put all that other stuff secondarily, you know, um, you know, they get gold pieces, I guess, because it's in there. But <laughs> um, the, it's the choice part that's exciting. And th this screenshot here is for mobile learning. So they learn about mobile learning. And actually, the way I teach is uh, I steal from Minecraft. Uh, it's, it's the Minecraft model of teaching, which is survival mode and then creative mode. So, you know, they're, they're, they immediately, like, go, I'll put them in breakout EDU. You're playing breakout EDU. Debrief, reflect. And then they get to make a breakout EDU, which we don't see enough of kids making the breakout games. So, Steve, how can we harness student choice and voice? I know these are new things to you and iterative. Yeah, to totally new concepts to me, <laughs> um, but I'll take a stab at it. Um, so, for, first off, I mean, I agree with you a, a thousand percent. And I'm so glad that Classcraft brought the questing in because that's when I adopted it. Um, and they did a beautiful job with it. Uh, student choice is at the center of my classroom. And I basically create a number of learning paths that kids can choose among. And, you know, they really have a lot of autonomy, whether it be which learning path they choose or even within a learning path, what like maybe tool they use. So my kids, I, I teach game design and I don't dictate what um, tool the kids use to create a game. Rather, you know, I've Find my strength is that I kind of understand the iterative design process, and that's what I primarily teach. Um, we're at a point now where kids have the ability and the resources to learn. I mean, I see my own kids at home learning what they want to learn by going to YouTube and other resources. So I like to put that learning in my kids' hands if they want to use a tool that might not be something I'm, you know, have expertise at. Um, and it's pretty amazing to watch them all working on different you know, with different tools, I kind of manage the overall process of like, you know, reminding them that they need to have others test their game. They need to go through the different, you know, iterations and, and, and all of that. But, um, but I think, uh, it, you know, and it, it kind of, I, I wanted to comment real briefly also on what you were talking about before when I was frantically raising my hand. Um, first off, as a parent, I have, um, two high school kids and, and that idea which I agree to about preparing them to get into college and then not preparing them for college is very scary. I have a, a daughter going to college next year. I also can say that sadly um, school has not been exciting for either of my kids for a long time and um, it's really challenging to be a very non-traditional teacher but still in somewhat of a traditional system and kind of seeing that. Um, and the other thought that came to me before was, you know, the whole idea, you know, Montessori is, you know, the Montessori approach is, is something um, used, you know, in for younger kids more than anything. And then oftentimes, even kids that go to a Montessori school, then leave the Montessori school and come to a traditional school. And one thing that was kind of odd to me is I, I spent a lot of time um, sort of almost having a chip on my shoulder about Montessori because when Montessori kids would come to the, to my middle school and they didn't know how to sit in their seat or do things that dealt with, you know, um, with, with conformity and um, compliance, you know, I thought they were doing something wrong. And then it occurred to me that Montessori has it completely right, only we don't allow for that type of exploratory learning in most cases. So, um, Compliance-based learning. Yeah, yeah. And it's sad <laughs> yeah. that... I remember a couple of years ago, there was some article that was going around about how the high-tech Silicon Valley people were not giving their kids devices and having them go to Montessori schools. And that was like some sort of hypocrisy. But it's not. That's only if you value screens differently. Because in screens, there, if you have the right application, like, I don't know, iMovie is a really good one. You know, mm -hmm. it's very playful. You know, it's not a game, but it's very playful. So if you have anything that's playful in front of you, um, you know, let's forget about the fact that it's a screen, but that you're creating content on something, uh, that's a really, really exciting thing. Uh, next slide, I'm going to ask John Fallon and uh, Paul DeVarsi to comment on. Specifically, 
Gone Home, Edith Finch, and um, her story. Can you make that happen, Mitch? Work your magic. And we have five minutes, right? No pressure. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes? I yeah, great. Uh, I'll be brief just because we don't have much time. Uh, one is, yes, I absolutely support using games as texts. Uh, the ones that you mentioned are fantastic. Uh, I've, I've also used a game recently called The Path. Anybody familiar with The Path? It's a Little Red Riding Hood sort of base story. Uh, it's, it's, it's a phenomenal feminist poetic metaphor that I've used in my all boys classes as a springboard to talk about representations of women. And, and it's a, it's a really powerful haunting text that has all of these different outcomes. It's very suggestive and, and, and it has all the qualities of a, of a complex and elusive literary text. So it, it's, it's, uh, it's absolutely very possible and actually fruitful and productive to use video games, um, as, as substitutions or, or, or with, you know, as a text within a, a traditional literature or a language arts classroom. And, and just to piggyback a little bit on the choice conversation very quickly, uh, one, one thing I've noticed at my school is that we've introduced Genius Hour project-based learning activities uh, to grades 11s and 12s who had never done anything like that before. And what's fascinating is that they've been so conditioned to be spoon fed and to take these very linear approaches to learning that they actually don't like it. Uh, you know, you would think that given the opportunity to pursue a passion project and do what you want, they actually said, you know, they've told me I, I, I wasn't involved in this project, but they've said, you know, I don't want to do it. I just want to be told what to do and I want to get it over with as quickly as possible. So there's definitely something that has to be within the culture from an early age and persistently to really teach them uh, to think in that way. And I think it goes to the point of going into to university and not being able to manage uh, the choices that are there for you. I'll hand it over to John. Uh, to John. Sure. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah, I've used um, Gone Home, a uh, lesson that Paula designed, and I, I've most recently used her story as the center of um, my class as a text. They're actually going to be beginning next week with my ninth graders. And uh, that worked uh, to teach unreliable narrators. Uh, so um, I could com I use it as a comparative text uh, with a series of short stories. And this year I I've made it much more explicit, but I introduced it to them um, as uh, the boss level. I actually put it up on the screen and we talked, to, had a brief conversation about unreliable narrators, especially first person narrators and how that's different than a regular one. And then I said, are you guys ready to prove that you can uh, understand unreliable narrators? And they, of course, all nodded their head very confidently, as ninth grade boys are wont to do. Uh, and then I just laughed at them and said, you're nowhere near ready. And I unplugged it. Um, and I said, we're starting at level one. <laughs> and I handed out the first short story. And then they're gradually working their way up uh, to that because it's going to be completely on their own. And I think it's uh, uh, somewhat related to choice in the sense that uh, you know, I just kind of throw it at them and I say, good luck guys. Uh, you have the tools, you have all the tactics that we've worked on, all the strategies, um, you know, do your best with this. And they have it in a hot seat method where they're all, uh, watching someone play it and giving feedback and advice. And I just kind of sit in the corner uh, and see how they do. You know, this, this reminds me of a quote I read, uh, Ian Schreiber, who, uh, who organizes the global game jam and, uh, uh, I saw the other day he commented on somebody on Facebook that um, we say uh, game design is basically all social sciences wrapped up together, except we use different words. So it's like this idea of level design to the boss level, right? So yeah, um, I don't I don't like to see when teachers are using calling their test the boss level. That's not the boss level. The, the boss level is what you're doing. You have to show you're demonstrating mastery of understanding. Uh, traditional texts where there's unreliable narrators, and then you're you're using all those tools to not instead of slaying Bowser as Mario, but to solve this murder mystery presented in this nonlinear story. And I think that's the best way to teach is to use what makes games so playful and interesting, and not the inherent structure that games are in that gamification structure. Some games don't even have that, like Monument Valley. There's no points in Monument Valley. You don't win Gone Home mm -hmm. or What Remains of Edith Finch unless you consider completing it, like a, a story. 
as I also find it's kind of interesting too, like um, in a sports competition, like a football, you want the game to end when your team is winning because you want it to end. So they win, but in a really good game, like a really good book, I always get kind of sad when you're towards the end because you know, the experience is almost over because a really good game is about the player's experience, not about winning or losing. And that's what we really need to adopt more in the classroom. So I know we're almost out of time, right? Right. right. There Lighting were two round. questions. Uh, right. So there's were, a couple of questions two. here. Yeah. I can. Yeah. So uh, one regarded uh, Minecraft and the time to use in the classroom. Um, there's a, an amazing uh, network of uh, global mentors that can help with that. Um, you know, there's a Minecraft Journey OneNote that uh, is on the website on uh, Minecraft Education Edition that can walk through steps. And of course, there's uh, other applications to mix in as well, like Scratch has an easier learning curve um, than Minecraft. Um, so, so does Lego <laughs> and cardboard and hot glue guns, right? I always like to give a nice analog alternative to students. And uh, regarding uh, her other question, regards um, Terry's right, question. There's a question from uh, Ping about, uh, do you okay. know any games that teach Chinese? I don't. Um, and I was in China <laughs> last year, and I, I, I don't know any games uh, other than your traditional language learning applications. Uh, although there is one in Gamify Classroom from Lee Sheldon. Um, he described this like um, alternate reality game that he created in his classroom where you're like stranded at the airport and you can only speak Chinese to get out of the airport. <laughs> but that's right. not a digital game. <laughs> And isn't there some like eStory or Storify? I think um, I may be getting the name wrong. Where theoretically the kids could be typing in the storyline using Chinese as opposed to doing it in English, right? Yeah, there's Story in Edu, which does that. Story, uh, right? There's, yeah, there's also you know you could take Werewolf and play it in Chinese, I suppose, right? <laughs> you know, right. anything that involves yep. a lot of discussion and orality to it. So, and something that we didn't touch on tonight as much. What about um, esports? I mean, do is that are kids learning, or are they? I mean, not that it's bad to have fun, but are they primarily just you know learn having fun when they're when they're participating in esports? Is that well, if a teaching having tool? Fun, if they're having fun, they're learning. There might right, not that's be true. right. There might not be a direct alignment to play Fortnite in the classroom, but mm -hmm. it could be in an after school club. Uh, you know, there's a, a lot of kids that like to play games, and they they're not selected for traditional sports teams. Mm -hmm. and, you know, whenever I hear esports, I think of chess club. You know, that's a game, so I don't see the big leap from going from having chess clubs in school to having esports teams. And now right. we have more right. and more, you know, uh, scholarships and other other available. Um, another another is from John Seely Brown, like 10 years ago, said that being an being a expert at World of Warcraft in a guild is better than having an MBA. So I'm kind of advancing through your slides to get to, I think, did you end with a um, with your contact information again? That's what I'm hoping. I did, yes. Yeah, Those are my details, okay. yeah. Um, so there's a couple questions that we didn't really, really get to, but I think that, I think the conversations were good. Um, you know, uh, it was great to hear from, uh, Steve and Paul and, and everybody else and Mark. Um, do you have any parting thoughts that you want to? Well, I, I see, I see, um, uh, Simone down there, Wade mm -hmm. from Italy, and, uh, he's going to be in an upcoming, uh, podcast show from, uh, Steve and I about how he uses uh, Assassin's Creed to teach Italian. So. Right, and I wonder if Simone <laughs> has anything that he can type in for Ping, who wanted to know about learning languages, because um, he's been using Assassin's Creed and, and other games to teach languages, it happens not to be Chinese, but maybe Ping and, and uh, Simone can get together. Good point. And this is what, and again, this is what we see the tribe doing is uh, teaching with games, not teaching like a game. And by when you're using teaching with games, they're adapting games the same way we adapt books. I'm not sitting mm -hmm. around waiting for, you know, catcher in the rye EDU with a dashboard. You know, we can make, we could do that ourselves right. and figure out where it fits in the curriculum. Right. Okay. Um, well, thank you. 
And uh, I'll, awesome. I'll see you at SD. You're going to be also at Games for a Change and a few other conferences this summer. And, yes, I'm having um, T-shirts made yeah. with dates in the back. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> okay, so I'll, 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 I'll see you on the conference circuit. And <laughs> uh, I'll see you online, and I'll see you in the tribe. Yes, thanks a lot. Thanks for dropping by, everybody, and taking the time. Okay, and uh, th yeah, and I want to thank everybody also. This is Mitch Weisberg. I'm going to sign off for EdChat Interactive. Um, you know, we do have the there is a Twitter chat on Thursday nights uh, with using the Games for Ed hashtag, and uh, Melissa Pilikowski, who um, I guess couldn't make it tonight, but uh, she runs that. She does a phenomenal job. Steve Isaacs is usually there, and a number of other people from the tribe. That's a good place to add, to ask questions as well. So uh, I'm going to sign off and uh, wish you all a good night. Uh, hope to see you online and hope to see you on June 20th uh, for for uh, Paul's section. Please please sign up. Uh, take care. Bye. <laughs>